We know what time it is. Amen. Response of reading 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All of scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Amen. You may be seated and turn back to John chapter 6, verses 31 through 46. In the 1992 movie, A Few Good Men, at the Guantanamo Naval Base in Cuba, Private William Santiago, a United States Marine, was tied up and beaten in the middle of the night. Afterward, he was found dead and Lance Corporal Harold Dawson and Private First Class Loudon Downey were accused of his murder and faced a court-martial. The defense was assigned to United States JAG Corps Lieutenant Daniel Coffey, played by Tom Cruise. And although Cruise is known for seeking plea bargains, a fellow lawyer, Lieutenant Commander Joanne Galloway, played by Demi Moore, convinces him that the accused Marines were most likely carrying out an order from the commanding officer. Santiago died after he broke the chain of command to ask to be transferred away. Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Markinson, played by Kevin Bacon, advocated for Santiago to be transferred. But base commander Colonel Nathan Jessup, played played by Jack Nicholson, ordered Santiago's platoon commander, Lieutenant Jonathan James, Kendrick, played by Keeper Sutherland, to, quote, train Santiago. Moore suspected that Dawson and Downey carried out a code red, which is an order for violent extrajudicial punishment. Galloway is bothered by Coffey's approach and Coffee Cruz resents that Galloway or Moore's involved in it at all. Cruz pursues the theory that Demi Moore put forth and called Colonel Nathan Jessup Jack Nicholson to the stand in an effort to uncover the conspiracy. The dramatic court scene goes like this. Cruz to Nicholson, did you order the code red? The judge said, you don't have to answer. <laughs> but Nicholson said, I'll answer the question. He said, you want answers? Cruz says, I think I'm entitled to them. Nicholson says, you want answers? Cruz says, I want the truth. Nicholson said, you can't handle the truth. What he meant by that was that there are things in war that require for those who are warriors to do certain things that others would not find pleasant or acceptable. And in order for the Marines to be prepared so that others won't die on their watch, Jessup or, or the Colonel Nicholson felt he had to do what he had to do, and he did order that code red. While that is fiction, it does illustrate that some aspects of the truth are not easily received. In our text today, Jesus shows why there are people who, listen, cannot handle the truth. They cannot handle the truth. Number one, they cannot handle the true deliverer of the bread of life. Verses 31 to 35. Secondly, they cannot handle the true determiner for the bread of life. Who gets it? Who calls people to? And then number third, and finally, the true director to the bread of life. Verses 41 through 46. Who is it that does the directing, 
so that people would come to Jesus. But first, let's look at the true deliverer of the bread of life. Verses 31 to 35. Our fathers, this is the Jewish people who had asked Jesus for another sign in, in verse 30. And they said, our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now you notice in the backdrop, Jesus fed the 5,000, but he only did it for one day. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. You got this wrong. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. You see, the Jewish people had in the backdrop of their thinking the teaching of the rabbis, and they quoted from Psalm 72, 16, that said the Messiah, when he comes, will outdo Moses with manna from heaven. Now, you know Moses, God used but God gave what, Moses, but God gave manna six days a week for 40 years. Amen? Amen? That's a long time. And since Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah, they were thinking, you ought to be able to do that. Matter of fact, what you did in giving bread for only one day and only for 20,000 is nothing. Because Moses in the wilderness, they had around 2 million who got bread every day of the week for 40 years. So they were saying, in essence, to Jesus, you ain't done nothing. Show us what you can really do. Really? See, they had, they had witnessed Jesus feed the 20,000, and they said nothing. They said, Moses did it for 40 years. And so they took, Mo they, they took what Moses did, or they thought Moses did, for granted. And even, if you remember going back in the book of Exodus, they complained, didn't they? They had complained about receiving the matter over and over. They got tired of it. And they complained. You see, they illustrated, even what these people illustrated in their reference to Jesus, in their, in their speaking to Jesus, that people take the goodness of God for granted. God fed them. They didn't have to go anywhere looking for any food in the wilderness, did they? He fed them from heaven. And, 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 and yet, they took him for granted. Oh, church, you know, the Bible says the, the main reason why the judgment of God comes upon people who reject him. In Romans 1, it says the wrath of God is real from heaven to those who, who, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And it goes on to say because they were not thankful. Oh, Thanksgiving is coming, isn't it? But we ought to be thankful every day and not take God's goodness for granted because every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down. And so, the Bible says, do everything without grumbling and complaining. Sometimes it's hard not to do that, isn't it? But we have to realize and think back that God is working. God, God is working. See, with the children of Israel in the wilderness, what they did is they saw the wonderful works of God. And they had a fable that Jeremiah, at the destruction of the temple, had taken some of the manna and hidden it. And when the Messiah came, he was going to provide manna. So they were saying, look, if you him, you did that great miracle the other day, now do a big miracle. Give us bread every day. Not every day, but every day. Amen? And, and, and so, they don't see the importance of what Jesus had done. And Jesus said, look, you all think that it came from Moses, but truly, truly, Moses didn't give you nothing. It came from the Father. It was miraculous. You see, he contrasts the source, because they misinterpreted it. It wasn't a man. It wasn't Moses. It was God. You see, as children of God, listen, 
all believers become the personal responsibility of an all-wise sovereign, that means he controlled everything, an all-powerful God. Amen. Oh, church, that's good news. That's, good news. that's hallelujah Amen. news. Amen? Amen? The truth is this. We have to see things in balance. God provides for his people. And it's taught throughout the Bible. But of course today, certain teachers have taken that teaching and combined it with greed and lust for power and taking things from people. And they teach that wealth is a God-given right of every believer. But didn't Jesus say the poor you will have with you always? Amen. And some of us will be poor. Didn't the book of Job show us that God's people stay true to God regardless of their circumstance? Wasn't that the issue in the book of Job? Didn't Satan say, look God, you protecting him. If you let me at him and do what I want to him, then he will curse you to your face. He will be just like everybody else. But, but, but God said, nope, my servant Job knows and loves me for me. Oh, church, don't we understand that God will take care of us. He doesn't promise us, he doesn't promise us right now uh, a mansion, a dwelling place that's luxurious and great. Now, we will have something like that in heaven, but he tells us that, listen, having food and clothing, therewith be complaining. Amen? Is that what he said? He said, to having food and clothing, with that, be content. Be content. Amen? But see, y'all, we got to do is read our Bible, don't we? When we see some of God's greatest men and women were destitute and suffered from sickness, that if you read the book of Hebrews, the Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith, some people stop at that point where then it goes on talking about where some of the people were faithful even though they were destitute, they were sawed and, uh, sawed and too, they were, they were mistreated, they were things were done to them, but listen church you gotta handle this truth cause God will provide he provided, then he'll provide now and he'll provide everything you need and when you need it cause just stop and think doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible that if he did not spare his only son, how shall he not also freely give us all things that we need? Oh, church, can you handle the truth? He will do what he says us to do. And so he teaches us not to worry, don't he? Because if we worry, that's the product of Little faith. So we got to ask ourselves this morning, are we worried? What are we worried about? If we have some things that are concerning us, it's different between worry and concern. Concern is you see a potential problem, an issue, a thing that could be something that needs to be dealt with and has to be dealt with. But worry is when you can't change anything about it. And yet you act like you can. Worry is also to not trust God. Because you should do it. First Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. You see, the manna came from God, and Jesus came from God. Both were provisions. The manna was just an illustration of what God would do later in Jesus Christ. That it would be the real thing. But it wouldn't just be physical. It'll be spiritual. Amen? Because our greatest need is the bread that comes down from heaven. Amen? And so, Jesus wanted them to know the true bread comes out of heaven. And so they would understand, or they would understand, who's the true deliverer of the bread of life? It is God who's the true deliverer through Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life. Do you know that truth this morning, church? Well, are you willing to tell others about it? But we have to learn to truly appreciate what God has done for us. 
in one of the Peanuts cartoons that used to be in the newspaper about Thanksgiving, Lucy asked Charlie Brown to help with her homework. She said, I'll be eternally grateful. Fair enough, said Charlie Brown. I never had anybody be grateful for anything I've done. She said, he said to her, just subtract four from 10 to get how many apples the farmer had left. Lucy said, is that it? I have to be eternally grateful for that? I was robbed. I can't be eternally grateful for that. It's too easy. With a blank stare, Charlie Brown said, well, whatever you think is fair, how about it just say, thanks, Charlie. <laughs> As Charlie was about to go, he met Linus. Linus asked, hey, Charlie Brown, what you been up to? He says, I've been trying to help Lucy with her homework. Linus says, did she appreciate it? Charlie Brown said, yes, but at greatly reduced prices. We have to appreciate what God has done and what God is doing. Because Jesus said the bread of God is he. Notice. If the bread of God in verse 33 is he. The true deliverer of the bread of life is the one who comes down from heaven. He had to come from heaven to earth to show us the way. Amen. From the, earth, from, the, from the earth to the sky, then he went, I sent that to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. And then we lift his name on high. Amen? Amen. And they said, after he said the bread's coming down, they still didn't understand. They said, give us this bread always in verse 35, 34. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. You see, Jesus introduced those I am statements. Those statements were so they would again come to understand the truth and be able to handle the truth and understand who Jesus is. Because you know, in John there are seven I am statements. Amen? Amen. First, he says, I am the bread of life. Here in John 6. Then he says, I am the light of the world. Amen? In John 8. And then in John 10, he says, I am the door of the sheep. And of course, when he's saying I'm the light, I'm the one God sent to show you truth and the light. To illustrate who he is. And illustrate what he wants to do. And then he says, I'm the door. You know, the sheep would be in a pen. And the shepherd would actually lay across the doorway so that they could only come in and go out through him. Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. Then he says, I am the good shepherd in John 10. I'm the good shepherd. I care for the sheep. Oh, don't you realize that he cares for you? That the God of glory looks down at us and he cares for us. And then he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen? In Luke, I mean, John eleven twenty five. 25. In other words, if you die, but you know me, you don't die. Because you live in me. And then he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 14, 6. In other words, there's no other way to get to God. There's no other way to get to heaven but through me. I'm the only way to eternal life. And then finally, he says, I am the true vine. In John 15, I am the source from which you can draw and have what you need to bear much fruit. I am everything you need. Oh, church, do you realize that Jesus is everything that we need. And we need that spiritual life first. That's what he was telling the people. Can you handle this truth? You need the bread from heaven to come down to give you true life. So you would know what life is really about. Jesus was speaking clearly of himself. Amen. He had made it clear that he came down from heaven. And that he had come from the Father. And that he was sent by the Father into the world. 
but they fail to understand. Seven times in this, Jesus referred to himself as coming down from heaven in John chapter 6. Amen? A statement to make it clear that he came from God and is God. But they responded with the human tendency to miss what God was doing and what God is saying. What is the purpose of the bread of God? Jesus said it is to give life to the world. But these spiritually blind Jews interpreted it literally <laughs> as referring to literal and physical bread. The Jewish crowd was like the Samaritan woman who interpreted Jesus' description of spiritual water as literal water. You remember, she said in John chapter 4, when Jesus said he had that water, Sir, give me this water so I don't have to come back to this well. <laughs> Amen? But they, don't, they didn't understand. Jesus was speaking about the greatest need. Jesus was speaking about the true need. Jesus was speaking about the true purpose that he came. You see, Jesus didn't come just to be a philosopher. Jesus didn't come to be a great teacher. Jesus didn't come to be a moral example. Jesus came to be a savior. You see, the reality is none of us are as good as God. We often compare ourselves with other people. But if we are true to ourselves, and if we've ever read the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, we know we fall short of that standard. Because we all know there have been times we lie. Times we didn't obey our parents. Times when we coveted, wanted what other people had. Times we got jealous of somebody else. Times we didn't love our neighbor, love God, and love the things of God. There were times when we failed big. And it wasn't one time. It happened many times. And so we have to realize we missed the mark. And so the deepest need we had is to be made right with God. Amen. Amen. But Paul said that the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he and they are he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. They are seen with spiritual glasses, with spiritual eyes. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and following. But the Jews only look at it from the natural. But Jesus makes a statement in the Greek that says, ego ami, I am. That's the same thing that was said in the book of Exodus 3 when God was speaking to Moses, I am, ego ami. If you looked in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And he says, I'm the bread, the artos in the Greek, of Zoe life. Zoe life is the real life, the eternal life, the life that does not end. It's not bio life. Bio, we get our word biology from natural life, but the Zoe is the life that God gives to Jesus Christ as he is the bread of life. And Jesus had the crowd where they needed to be. They wanted bread, didn't they? They just didn't understand what Jesus meant. That he was the Zoe life. He's not referring to the physical, but spiritual, eternal, that's found and attained only in him. And so church, we want to let people know that Jesus is the true life. He's the great I am from God. Jesus wanted the people to understand the truth. That he was saying, I am God. He wanted them to understand the truth that he's father and he are the deliverer of the bread of life. And that bread, that life will never, that bread will never, never run out. You'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. The Jewish folks didn't understand that. And sadly, people don't understand that today. They, many times the, the invitations to the gospel are given to people not, not really illustrating the spiritual need, but temporal needs. Sometimes people use that passage in Matthew 
Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Making it uh, appear that it's just the burdens of life. You are, you are going through a difficult situation or a difficult relationship or just difficult in time or anxiety in your life. And you come into Jesus only for the temporal reasons or the temporal reasons. Need. Matter of fact, there's an evangelistic organization that puts up billboards all across the country, and it has billboards that says, anxious, come to Jesus. Worry, come to Jesus. This, come to Jesus. But here's the problem. Jesus has to fix your connection problem with God before he can deal with all those other things. You cannot put the cart before the horse. And that's why Jesus said in, in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all the things you need, because he talks about all the things you need prior to 6, 33, all the things you need will be added unto you. Amen? Amen. But the problem is, in our fallenness, no man seeks God. Romans 3.11 says that, doesn't it? In our own, we don't want him. Jesus said in John 3, why don't men come to the light? Because men love darkness rather than light. They love doing their evil deeds. But Jesus wants people to understand, wants us to let them know that, oh, he, he gives them the true life, the Zoe life. And yet people miss out on it. Jesus said those who come and believe in him, they will have that life. But they didn't believe, did they? To believe is to put all our faith and trust in him. You see, people don't reject Jesus because they lack evidence for believing in him. Sometimes people will say, show me something, God, and I'll believe. Speak out of heaven or give me a sign and, and, and I'll believe. But God has already given all the signs he needed to give. As we said previously, as Jesus said to the people of his day, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh for a sign and no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, you want a sign? I'm going to die. But on the third day, I will rise with all power and authority and victory over sin and death. But see, the reason why people don't see this it's because Satan has blinded their minds. This Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, if our gospel is veiled or hidden, it's hidden to those who are lost and whom the God, little g, of this world, the devil, has blinded their mind. Let the light of the glorious gospel of the grace of God to shine on them. You know, for us, bread is not necessarily a staple as it was for the people of that day. Bread was absolutely essential for them. And some of us do low carb diets, and so we don't want any bread, amen? And so <laughs> it, it may not have the same impact to us, but Jesus was saying, I'm the food, <laughs> the spiritual food that you need. And if you have it, you will never hunger, you will never thirst, because he will supply your every and your eternal need. See, Jesus wanted them to get this true. He's the deliverer of the bread of life. Secondly, he wants them to get the truth that he's the determiner for the bread of life. Look at verses 36 through 40. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. But all that the Father gives me. So the Father determines that. Will come to me. 
And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I'm determined to do the Father's will. And this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up at the last day. That's the, that's the judgment. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. How long is everlasting life? Everlasting. Everlasting is everlasting. Now, who determines that people get this bread of life? In verse 37, it says, all that the who? The Father is the determiner for those who get the bread of life. All that the Father gives to Jesus will come to Jesus. But look in verse 36, Jesus says, but I said to you that you have seen me, yet you do not believe. In other words, all that Jesus had done, they would, they refused to believe. Remember we talked about missing Jesus, even amidst the miracles. The miracles he done would appoint to him to show who he is, and yet they missed him, and yet in the same thing, Jesus says, you absolutely do not believe your, you, what you have seen should bring you to faith, but it hasn't brought you to faith. They didn't accept him. They had just seen what he could do. But Jesus says, the fact is simply that no one could miss what he had done. They saw it. They saw he was a promised Messiah, even doing miracles that would be expected of him. Amen? But they refused to believe. You see, when people's heart is hard, only God can crack that hard heart. Only God. And, then, and, 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 and the next verse explains why they will not believe. And this is true even today. That people who do not believe is because God knows what people will and will not do. And nothing can confuse God about what people will and will not do. It's like the four high school boys who agreed to skill class and go see a new popular movie. When they report to school the next day, they told all their teachers that their car in which they had been riding had gotten a flat. In one class, they had missed a test. And much to their relief, the teacher in that class smiled and said, that's okay. You missed a short test yesterday. So you four boys take your seats in the four corners of the room, apart from each other, and I will give you a piece of paper. As the boys got to their seats in the different corners of the room, she gave them a pencil and paper and asked them, write down which tire was flat. <laughs> God knows what people will and will not do. And that's why Jesus says, all that the Father. This clearly teaches God's sovereignty, listen, church, over salvation, over all who come to Jesus for salvation. Note that it says all, without exception. It, mean, it does not mean all of mankind, but it's qualified by the ones the Father gives to the Son. Amen? Because it says, all the Father gives to me, that's divine sovereignty, God, they then will come to me. That's the human response. And so Jesus is saying that, that these, the souls that are chosen are the elect. They are called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. And when they hear the Spirit, they, they, they respond. Remember the scripture says in the book of Hebrews, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. See what Jesus is doing here in this text is showing and explaining the process of how it is we get saved. It is, but this is one of the most profound and most difficult 
and the most argued about teachings of Scripture, God's sovereignty and salvation. You see, the Bible explains salvation from both the divine viewpoint and the human viewpoint, the human response and what happens to the human. This is controversial today because it wasn't so much in the past, but since most people look at the scripture from man's viewpoint, they'll say they don't understand why the Bible presents salvation this way. But realize this, church, the truth is it starts with God. God knows who will and who will not be saved. And he's always known. That's why the Bible says we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Before time. See, God can't learn. He don't learn anything. He has known everything from the beginning. Yeah. Now, that should blow your mind. Because that shows you how awesome of a being that he is. Because he is he is holy other. What people don't realize is they want to bring God down to their level because they don't understand how he works and how God explains his character and the outworking of his sovereign will. Sometimes the thing God does is as Peter said about Paul's writing in 2 Peter 3.16 there are some things that are hard to understand which the untaught, the ignorant and unlearned wrestle to their own as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. In other words, they can't handle the truth. It's just like people who deny the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity that the Bible presents God is one God, one being, one essence, but three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It is clearly spelled out in the New Testament. It is hidden in the Old Testament. We don't have time to go look at all that. We don't have time to go look at all that, but, 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 we, but it's there. It is there. And uh, in, in, in John chapter 1, we see at the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. We see in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God speaking to the Son, God the Father, speaks to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So God the Father speaks to God the Son. There are people who deny the Trinity because there's some things about God and His ways that is hard to understand. And we can't fully comprehend it. But here's the truth, church. In salvation, because of Adam's sin, we're all born, born, dead in trespasses and sin. Now some folks will say, no, we're not. We're, we're, we're neutral. No, we're not. Just follow a child in development, and you will see they are sinner. And they were illustrated eventually along the way. Amen? Right when they get to the terrible twos. Amen? And in Romans 5.12, it says, in Adam, we all die. In Christ, we shall be made alive. You see, Adam and Eve were the only human beings who were alive spiritually. But we are not. So God had to elect to choose those who be saved. Now, some people try to make it more acceptable to humans by saying God looked down through history, saw who would choose him, and he chose him. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that what God, in essence, does in choosing us for salvation is bring us back to the state of Eden. You see, in Eden, Adam and Eve were alive. And uh, 
if you and I were in Eden with Adam and Eve, all the people of the world, we would be alive. Because Adam and Eve were spiritually alive. They didn't die until they sinned, right? He said, the day you eat thereof, you sin, you will surely die. That's when they died spiritually. But if we were there with them, we would have a choice like them. But we, we, we weren't there. We came through them. But for God to save us, he has to make us back like they were in Eden. So that's what the Bible teaches in Ephesians it says, but you, Ephesians 1, you were dead in trespasses and sin. He makes alive. He regenerates us. And so then as Acts 26, 18 says, God opens our eyes so we can turn from darkness unto light. We can then choose because before our eyes were blinded by the devil, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God, little G of this world, had blinded our eyes. We couldn't see. You know, in special locations throughout the country, there are special bomb shelters. And in case of a nuclear attack, but they're not for you or me. They are designed for people who are on this to be brought to those shelters so they can be saved and restart the civilizations after the nuclear war and after the fallout is over. Although they are chosen and the place is designed beforehand for them to be safe at, if they don't, if they don't go to the place at, at, at the time, they won't benefit from the bomb shelter, will they? But they are determined beforehand who can go in and who cannot go in. Now this analogy is a human one, so it breaks down when we try to deal with God. But I'm trying to illustrate you, illustrate to you somewhat what salvation is like. Because God has chosen us in him. And God's choosing us in him is because God is perfect. Did you, did you hear that? God is perfect. As a matter of fact, God is so perfect that everything he created was perfect. You remember, and it says this in scripture that God is perfect, but you remember when God created the devil? And in, uh, 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 is, uh, in, I, in Ezekiel 28, it talks about that he was in Eden, the garden of God, and all those things. And then at the end, it says he was perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him. The devil was perfect until he sinned. God cannot sin. God's perfectness is innate. It what's make, it's what makes him him. And it cannot be lost. And, and God's perfectness, he chooses this sin. When God chooses us, it's perfect. It is perfect. So that when the time comes and he opens our eyes, guess what? We choose him. We choose him. Because he cannot make a mistake. Because that's the way God is. He has predestined us to adoption as sons. And, and then... The human responsibility is that when Jesus says, all that the Father gives me, so we, the ones he gives, then we come to him. We come to him, and he's telling this to his people so they can understand this truth. You are not coming to me because you don't know the Father. And you don't know what the Father wants to do. The mystery of this salvation, it shouldn't be anything that really confounds us. We don't always understand but we apprehend. Because there's other things the Bible teaches us that we don't fully understand. But we apprehend. In other words, we receive it. For example, how many of y'all have read Galatians 2.20? Yeah. Well, Paul says, I am what? Crucified with Christ. And in the mind of God, all of us literally were 
crucified with Christ. You, you, don't, you don't remember ever being crucified with Christ, do you? But we, we were in the mind of God. And then Paul goes and says, I'm crucified with Christ, so some of me is dead. He said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So Christ is living in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, who living? You or Christ? Both of them. You are living and Christ is living. It's a mystery, isn't it? Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now more in my absence, notice it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Notice it doesn't say work for. It says work out. And then he goes on to say, for it is God working in you. So who's doing the work? You are and God. You are and God. God's working in you. You working out. It's just the same thing as salvation. God chose us. God opens our eyes and we believe. A number of years ago, a woman entered a store and asked for half a pound of tea. The young clerk weighed it out and handed it to her in a parcel. The next morning when the store opened the clerk, he discovered that there was a four ounce weight that was on the scale that he didn't know about the day before. And so when he, once he realized that, he realized the sale to the woman was not uh, a proper sale. She had been cheated. Many merchants would not have worried about that discovery, but not this clerk. He weighed out the balance of the half pound. He set up the store and carried it to the defrauded customer, to the woman who had been shorted. The name given to this man in later times was the name Honest Abe. It was President Lincoln who deserved that name because in that case and many others, when he represented people in his law practice, he could be trusted to properly handle the truth. You see, he realized that he had made a mistake, not intentionally, but once he realized that he had made a mistake, he wanted to do something about it. Oh, church, <laughs> that's what we have to do. If, 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 if we are not doing the things that God has called us to do, we are not properly handling the truth. But when we change and say, Lord, help me to be strong. Lord, help me to obey you. Lord, help me to walk in a way that's pleasing to you. Then that is properly handling the truth. Because God is able, oh church is able, to make us what he wants us to be. Aren't you glad that you can handle the truth because of what God is doing in and through you? If you agree with me, won't you stand as we prepare for the time of commitment? Amen.